anything different about you? His house, one of Newmarket's landmarks. Its inhabitants are Mark Prescott is loyal, demanding, entertaining, and one of racing's legendary trainers. We're like schoolmasters, and the the horses are, are the pupils, the owners are the parents, the race course is the exam, and there's tremendous pleasure to be got out of a relatively untalented pupil doing well, uh, as well as the, 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 the obviously the relatively few highly talented pupils that, that go on as well. I've read that sometimes you don't mind having a more untalented pupil if, if the parents are palatable. <laughs> I think that's very important. Uh, I, I've always said that, uh, you know, you always, as a trainer you always want to take a, a, a bad horse for a nice man because next year he'll be a nice man and he'll probably have a nicer horse. Uh, if you take a good horse for a bad man, next year the likelihood is you'll have a bad horse and then you've got a proper pigeon pair, haven't you? <laughs> the list of former trainers in Heath House reads like a who's who of training greats. And the current incumbent certainly isn't out of place with the names that have gone before. Can I just ask about your interest in racing? where that came from? Oh well, the usual thing I'm afraid at that age is there was a, I, I was brought up in Devon on a farm and there was a pretty little girl that kept riding by on a pony and that sort of uh, in, in inspired me that it was about time to learn to ride and my marvellous stepfather, I was very lucky, I had a marvellous father and then a marvellous stepfather which is unusual really, you know, and, and uh, he sent me off to learn to ride uh, with a lady called Mrs. Selly and she was mad on racing, and when she saw how small I was, she was determined I was going to be a jockey. I'm afraid she was sadly disappointed in the end. Um, and uh, she sent me down to ride for the local trainer, and I started with him when I was 13 or 14. He used to cycle seven or eight miles in every day and seven or eight miles back, and I loved every moment of it from the very beginning. And um, I can remember vividly, you know, my mother would ask me to cycle two miles to the post box and I'd go into a sulk all day. And Mr. Kernick would give me a ring and ask me to go in because the horse was sick or leaving early and I'd cycle seven in and seven back and love every moment of it. So, you know, and so I was absolutely hooked. And, and then I, I was lucky enough to ride a winner on my first ever ride <laughs> on a 12-year-old novice chaser. 12 years, he'd never won a race and just everything went my way and um, I remember going into the last thinking that I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning and Mr. Koenig apparently was up in the stand saying he's going to fall off, he's going to fall off <laughs> but um, amazingly we, we stayed together and that won and sort of to ride a winner at, at 15 at Wincanton you know was you know I was fired really you know and, and I never wanted to do anything else fortunately I was always more interested in training than I was in riding um, so as I was a very, very moderate amateur, um, you know, thank God I hope I made a better trainer. But you say that, you, you, you won a race, you had that thrill, you, you jumped around the entry in oh, the Grand yeah. National. We rode a few winners, but uh, I had no, um, I just wasn't very good, you know, I just wasn't very good. Um, and, uh, but it was a privilege to ride at that time, uh, and I loved every, every moment of it. And then of course I broke my back and I, went, I was in hospital for 18 months and that really changed my life because uh, everything I believed when I went into hospital I didn't believe when I came out it completely changed my view of of everything explain for us well I think you, it gave you a, a, a completely different perspective on what is really important and what isn't really important and you saw I mean I was bad enough but you saw people in there particularly most cyclists who'd had the most horrendous, horrendous accidents. And um, whilst I came out believing it was very important to do your job to the absolute best of your ability, I also came out strongly of the view that if you have two beaten favourites at Hamilton, it really isn't all that important at the end of the day. It matters very much that you do your job to the best of your ability, but uh, you've got to also have a sense of proportion that uh, the derby is just 12 horses running up a field on the first Saturday in June, you know. 
we think it's very important. But when you come to die and the Almighty says to you, you know, now then, what's your name? And you say, uh, Mark Prescott, sir. I think you put in a sir, don't you? You know. And he said, what did you do? And I said, I was a racehorse trainer. What? I tried to find a horse to run up a field faster than 12 others and win the derby. He said, well, I've got Mother Teresa in here, you know. I've got proper people here. I don't need you, you know. So I think we've all got to remember that, um, that uh, whilst it's important to do it well, it may be not all that important. So I think it gives you a balance. In a way, did that perspective also come from your father dying when you were early and, and also your friend Graham Rock? Well, of course, Graham was a lot later on. But um, yes, I think, I, I think that it, it, that I used to lie in hospital because I was totally paralysed for a while. Totally. Couldn't blink, couldn't swallow, nothing. And uh, I used to lie there and think if I could have the worst day of my life up till now, the very worst day I can remember, I would chop off my arm to have it. Why flat trainer and not national hunt then, when you decided to go? Well, I was very lucky because um, whilst I was recovering in hospital, Jack Leach, who was a, wrote that marvellous book, Sods I've Cut on the Turf, and was a very good trainer and a very good jockey, Jack Leach had a girlfriend in Newmarket and he wanted a safe house to come for a weekend and the girlfriend had had an affair with my stepfather when he was up at Cambridge. So they came down to Devon for the weekend and I was pottering about in a plaster cast and when Jack Leach came back to Newmarket on the heath he saw Mr Wall, Mr Jack Wall, famous Newmarket trainer from a famous Newmarket training family and uh, Mr. War said to him, you know, I haven't been feeling too good. I, I could really do with an assistant. I never thought I'd need one, but I think I could do with an assistant. And uh, Jack Leach said, I saw just the man yesterday. And so uh, he sent me, he rang me and told me to go up and meet Mr. War the next day at Newbury. And I did. And the interview lasted three and a half minutes. And uh, Mr. War said, you better start tomorrow. So I did. I went home, packed everything, I never saw home again. And I came here to uh, Heath House and I was assistant trainer to Mr. War for two and a half marvellous, marvellous years. And um, he was a very, very hard taskmaster and worked himself very hard. So you never resented it because he worked himself very hard. And um, during that two and a half years, I never had one single day off. He never said to me, it's Christmas afternoon, uh, don't come in, you know. It never crossed his mind. I never, never crossed his mind. And then one day he said to me, I'm, I'm fed up with training these, you better, you better train them. It was in about May, you better train them. He said, you'll be all right. And uh, I said to him, well, I, I, I rather wanted to train National Hunt Horse. He said, don't. And that was all he ever said. And he never mentioned it again. And then in September, he said, I've had a word with all the owners and uh, they'll buy the yard for you on an interest-free loan, can you imagine? And so I set up the next year and I was 20 when I got a provisional license, 21 when I started. And I was the youngest trainer in Newmarket by 19 years. The next youngest was Johnny Winter. So luck is a great thing. You've got to get lucky. And I always say to people when they're having a really, really bad time, you know, what little consolation it might be that the um, worst day of my life, without any doubt, was the day I broke my back. Um, I quite honestly would think about it every hour at some point. I'd never, never forget it. It was so terrible. But it turned out to be the best day of my life because uh, had it not happened, I'd have never have come here. I'd have never met Mr. War. So I always say to people having a really, really terrible time, if you can just hold on, you never know. It might be this is the, the start of something a lot better. You never know. You've never looked back and thought, I'd like, I would like to train a, a good national hunt. No, hunt. no, no. <laughs> I don't know how those national hunt boys train them. I mean, those strain tendons and things, I, I don't know how they do it. I'm lost in one, though, and praise for them, really. Your father and your grandfather were barristers, am I right in saying yes. that, and MPs? Yes, both of them. Both of them. Both very, very interesting people. Both very bad-tempered, which is where I inherited it from. But, uh, you haven't I'm, been bad-tempered to us. <laughs> but I'm very, very uh, um, 
grateful to my father because he was very, very tricky, you know, and life was always on the edge. You never quite knew what was going to happen. Um, and Mr. War was very fiery and very unforgiving. And I'm quite certain that uh, if it hadn't been for the old man, I wouldn't have survived Mr. War, you know. You have a reputation of being a very, very disciplined disciplinarian. Is that, is that a reputation you, you enjoy cultivating <laughs> or...? <laughs> you never know which came first, do you? Um, I think, uh, obviously, uh, Mr. War was a great disciplinarian, which is probably why I got on with him. Um, and um, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, things go a lot better if, if it's run tightly, you know, if you run a tight ship and, uh, uh, and I think, I do believe you've got to set an example. You can't expect everybody else to do it if, if, if you don't, you know. Consistency is the watchword at Heath House. On average, Sir Mark Prescott trains one in four winners from every runner that leaves his stables. Every trainer has his own theory. I'm not saying mine's one bit better than anybody else's, but I believe that the, the more relaxed they are, the more they'll eat, the more they'll eat, the more I can gallop, and the more I gallop, the fitter they get, the fitter they get, the more they win. And so I try and design everything to be as quiet and um, as relaxed as I can make it, you know, on the basis that then they'll stand more hard work, you know. I mean, it's quite interesting, these, these horses here haven't been hand-picked for you. You've got every single one of them's a winner bar three this season. So while you can do that, it must be working more mm. or less okay. I bet the three that haven't won so far will be winning soon. Oh, well, it'd be nice if they did. One of them's taking its time. <laughs> Sir Mark is a trainer with a philosophical outlook, and to quote Kipling, he can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Why did they come up the rail? Because they go absolutely straight, so there's less strain on any leg. I think if you allow them to canter in the middle here, they have to follow me, the horse is looking around, wandering the lads, if they come right up that rail. So they're much more balanced. Are you still observing? You know, we're back yeah, in. you bet. What's blowing, what's sweating, what looks on edge, you know. Just to recap what you just said, you're, you are very focused, what you were just saying before. Yeah, yeah, and uh, often people ride out. Somebody said to me, oh, I saw you, I was riding out for somebody else yesterday. I, I never saw you, you know, what? I just wouldn't, I never noticed, just never noticed. Because when you're out here, you want to be, you want to be looking at that. How many races ahead in your own mind do you plan for each horse? Depends on the horse, really, you know. They've got to have so much ability before you can look a long way ahead. But I do my entries four weeks in advance. So all, when the entry form comes, I do my entry straight away and then it's in your mind, and then I change it daily as we go, but it makes you think a long way ahead. But what's quite interesting is you haven't seen one horse sweat, one horse mess about, one horse... They are impeccably behaved. If you're a horse is really only misbehaved. If you ask them to do what they're not capable of doing, do you see what I mean? I've got a thing up in the uh, saddle room and it says, confident horses win races, frightened horses might win one. You know, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Sir Mark Prescott is obsessed with detail. He gets that detail from his work riders. But one thing he doesn't do is suffer fools gladly. A few years ago we had a new girl with us and it was her first day in sort of February and all our horses were coughing and filthy noses and ringworm and driving me absolutely mad and all the other trainers' horses are sailing along, you know, in perfect order. And she was sort of towards the back of the string and as you've heard when they come by, I always say to him, Cough Colin, three, and Dickie, nine, and Henry, seven, and he seems very flat, and so on. And then, of course, we got to this girl, and she hadn't a clue what they were talking about. So I said, well? So she went, <laughs> terrified. So I said, how many? So she So I said, how many? So the lad behind said, cough. 
<laughs> so she went, <coughs> I said, for fuck's sake, I've got enough horses coughing here without you coughing, stupid girl. <laughs> so all trainers, you know, in the spring, when their horses are off colour, you know, they, they find it very difficult. Yeah. And they all have a swim at least once a day? Yeah, after work, they all swim just one straight. This isn't for exercise, this is to cool them off. And after you, when you, if you run for the bus and you get hot, and you come back and you sit in the office, you stiffen up, don't you? If you had a swim, cool, and then go in, you're fine. There's a waiting list for horses that want to be trained at Heath House, so Mark at the moment restricts himself to just over 80. I, I like detail. I like detail, and uh, I think that training is a combination of, of grind and detail, and you, you must either like it yourself, or if you're a, a bigger trainer, you've got to find people who you can rely on to take care of that for you while you, you look after the bigger picture. But as I've always liked it myself, I've always tried to keep the numbers down so that uh, I don't have more than I can enjoy doing that with, you know. Jack, whatever's come over I'm just hungry, that's all. Why, what's the matter with you? Nothing's the matter with me, Jack. I'm all right. The good old 50s. What a carry-on and not a care in the world. But we do get older, and then there's so much more to take care of. Being over 50, you really need to think about leaving a little extra behind for your family and for funeral expenses. So I'd like to tell you about the Sun Life Guaranteed Over 50 plan. It costs from just £6 a month and pays out a valuable cash sum when you've gone. If you're between 50 and 80, you're guaranteed to be accepted with no medical needed. Simply call free today on 0800 50 55 50. Don't worry, there's no obligation and no salesman will call. You'll get a useful pack with a free illustration of how you could leave that little bit extra behind. And there's a choice of free gift when you take out the plan. So call AXA Sun Life free today on 0800 50 55 50 and find out how the guaranteed over 50 plan can leave your loved ones more than just happy memories. Oh, wacko. Racing doesn't come much better than this. Champions Day at Newmarket, Racing Post Trophy Day at Doncaster and the Breeders' Cup all covered in one great Timeform offer. Get Timeform race cards for these star-studded events at the special price of just £14. To order, call free on 0800 731 2045. Three top meetings for just £14. 0800 731 2045. You can't ignore all those huge credit card loan bills. You don't want to think about it. And you can't pretend it's not happening. So if you need help, call HFS Loans right now. At HFS Loans, we could reduce all your debts into one affordable monthly repayment. And the good news is, our interest rates are from as low as 6.9%. If you've been turned down because of your poor credit ratings and you have CCJs, or you're self-employed and have no equity in your home, then call this number and talk to HFS Loans today. You can borrow up to £250,000 and we can lend you 150% of your home's value. In fact, all circumstances will be considered. Don't let those bills get you down. Take an easy loan from HFS and you could soon have extra money in your pocket. Call HFS Loans right now on 0800 197 1769. That number again, 0800 197 1769 or visit hfsloans.co.uk. The world is one big address book with all your best friend's names in it. It reminds you to call John, who's just returned from his dream holiday. Call someone. Hello. Now is good. Hello. Vodafone. How are you? To leave your family more than just happy memories, call free today on 0800 50 55 50 and find out about the Sun Life Guaranteed Over 50 plan. Talk about something of horses, obviously. Hasten to bed. A Cesarewitch and, and a Yeah, a wonderful horse. How I got him beaten, the Cesarewitch, to this day, I don't know. I can see him lobbing along at the bushes now, still on the bridle, and uh, was he the shortest price favourite for the Cesarewitch has ever been or something. Uh, but he didn't quite get home. Um, and uh, then, of course, he just got beat in the uh, Northumberland plate. Everybody thought he'd won. 
and then his great day came when he when he won the e ball. They come down towards the final furlong and the favourite leads on the table. E ball, this is hasten to earn a clear by a length and a half. But here come a host of horses to come and take him. Afterwards, well through the second place on Arctic third as he race up towards the line. Hasten to earn, hasten to earn, got to win it. Hasten to earn, afterwards, well, doing the patrol. And then, unfortunately for me, he was owned by a wonderful owner, Josephine Abercrombie very marvellous looking sort of 70 year old American and she had pin oak stud, marvellous stud there and she used to send me these horses that very cleverly I think, people don't do it now, that were unsuited to American racing and sent them to England. You hear all the time about English horses going to America but she did it the other way around and we had a phenomenal success for her and she used to just come over for a fortnight a year and in her jet, in her private jet, the week of Ascot and then a week after and I used to try and scoop everything together so all her horses were running when she was over and I think one year famously she had six horses with me five of them ran and they won eight races and were second once in the two weeks she was here and she just used to keep flying around in this Lear jet I remember it used to take 15 minutes to get her to Brighton from Cambridge <laughs> picking up another trophy and saying gee this is the most wonderful moment of my life and then she'd head off to Carlisle for another one you know so it was great great fun and she was a very interesting woman she had a stable full of boxers Carl the Truth Williams and, and all those sort of boxing people and I actually met her through boxing and uh, so it was great great fun training for her and she'd had six husbands as well so she'd led a, a real life you know and uh, I remember we got this phone call at the end of the season saying you know I'm very sorry uh, I don't like flying around anymore I'm not going to have any more horses in Europe and so our six including Hasten to Add went and poor John Gosden lost some and the fellow in France and they were all scooped back and I remember John saying to me, I don't know how she could behave like that really, you know, particularly to you, you've been such a friend of hers. I said, look John, when, you, when you've been through six husbands, five or six trainers in a day is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I still, I still get a phone call from her always at Christmas and she's had some very good seasons in the States, but she and Hayson to add were a marvellous, we had a marvellous time, you know. York has always been a happy hunting ground for Sir Mark and it proved to be the case when Pivotal in the Cheveley Park colours on the near side won his first Group 1, the Nunthorpe. Well, it was a great day because um, uh, it, it was, I think it was our first Group 1 winner. Um, although we'd won a couple of um, Nassau's, which are now Group 1. And um, he was homebred by Cheveley Park. And that was everything because how many stallions nowadays are bred by a stud and good enough to go back to the stud where they were foaled as group one winners to become, as he has done, a top class stallion and they've done it also with Medician. But that was their first and it was our first group one, you know, and it was their first one to come back. And uh, so it, it was a great day, it was a short head finish Poor Henry Candy, who's uh, I'm godfather to his daughter. Poor Henry was beaten a short head. Um, so it was full of drama and, and uh, it was a great day. And, and it's wonderful to see what a success he's being at stud, you know. So I bathe in his reflected glory. So Mark has enjoyed considerable success too in the John Smith's Cup, most notably with Pasternak, another impressive winner on the Knavesmire. It's a great race, I think, uh, because there's so many difficulties with it and uh, Pasternak's was was a great day the ground was really too firm for him and of course G-Rock and the boys had, had all had this plan we'd hatched this plan that we'd only run him twice all year and try and win the Magnet and the Cambridgeshire and of course they doubled him up and one thing and another so it, it was a it was a great day when he won. Here comes Pasternak, kept in by Keenan My Heart. From the back, uh, here comes Southerly win the yellow steed. On the wide outside, Jamie Lasquar with the run. But Pasternak has come to mow the ball down. Oh, it's Pasternak in the lead. The pack are closing. Here comes Najim Mabib with a big run. Game Floyd with a run. But Pasternak holds it at bay. Pasternak wins it close for second. Najim Pasternak had landed the first leg of what was to be an almighty double. Next, it was off to Newmarket, where he'd start favourite to win the Cambridgeshire and face, amongst others, Rudimental. Well, the owners of the second horse were absolutely marvellous, Cheveley Park again, Mr and Mrs Thompson. And um, 
we had the, the, the Cambridgeshire Gallop and Farmos led it again and, and Pasternak just beat rudimental length maybe, three parts for length at their race course weight about sort of seven or eight days before and uh, obviously Chibley Park, you know, they were keen to run Rudimental, who was obviously a good horse in his own right. And Rock, of course, and the boys had all this money rolling onto Pasternak, and uh, they were well aware that Rudimental would have to run. And I had lunch with Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, and Mr. Thompson always puts you right on the spot, you know, and he said, how will uh, Rudimental run? And I said, well, all I can tell you, Mr. T, is that he'll be three parts of a length behind <laughs> Pasternak. Anyway, the race, off went the race, and um, George went, ran up the middle. It was a beautiful sunlit day, and George was up the middle, and probably in front a little bit sooner than we'd planned. And John Lowe rode rudimental and came right up the stands rail. Pasternak went two or three clear, and then he started to just falter that last 150 yards. And uh, rudimental, Lowe pulled him wide, very wisely, not to help Pasternak, and came up that stand rail. And, it was apparent to me, sort of 180 yards out, that I was going to be first and second. What wasn't quite so clear was which was going to win. Graham Rock was right beside me, you know, with untold thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds running on it, you know. With 150 yards to go, Rock just tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I do hope you're not going to f*** this up, old man. <laughs> but Pasternak hung on, uh, one by three quarters for length, or whatever it was, and uh, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson were the first people to congratulate the boys. So I think that was a, a red letter day as well. Although, funny enough, I remember thinking as I came off the stands, what a wonderful trainer I was. <laughs> and uh, uh, some one of the press men immediately told me that William Hastings Bass and Steve Norton had both had first and second in the Cambridge, I think, in the, in the previous 10 years. So it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was. <laughs> I found myself sort of taking the run up sort of a furlong and a half sooner than I would have liked but so it was a case of you know just get on with it give him a dig in the ribs and hope you you get home and I could send Slowy coming up the fence I could see those chiefly part colours creeping up on me and I thought oh god yeah and I had lucky enough to just hold him off by by half or three parts of a length. I walked into the paddock and I remember uh, Sir Mark saying to me he said Lou and he said uh, if there wasn't a very good horse in this race I think you could win the Cambridgeshire and I, my reply to him was, I suppose you trained a very good horse. We'll just wait and see, he says, we'll wait and see. And sure enough, uh, his very good horse won it and I was second. Did you enjoy the win for, for Graham? Oh, wonderful, yes, wonderful. But of course he was well then, it, he was well then. But uh, in that very moving obituary he wrote for the Observer, um, he said, you know, he drove home with his wife and he thought that, that nothing, nothing could ever be as good as this and nothing that had happened to him since, including die of cancer, had made him think it was wrong. And I often think of that now, because if you think that being a trainer is unimportant, which it is, I suppose against that, if you've given one or two people the day of their lives, well then, perhaps it's all right, you know. What about foreign affairs? Yeah, he's a wonderful horse. Uh, I mean, his Annus Mirabilis was when he was three, um, and the great thing was to try and win the Magnet and the Ebor and somebody like uh, Jim McGrath will soon tell us, but I believe no horse has ever run in the same race, in both races in the same year. I mean, there's a mile and a quarter and one's a mile and six. So that was the big task, could, could, he do the, could he do the two? And he got the first leg well, because everything went wrong in the race and, and he was uh, badly hampered and the whole race plan went out the window. And, uh, but he and George got up and won. And then he put up a tremendous effort in the e-ball, we decided to run him as if stamina wasn't a, a point and George kicked on and Aidan's horse just got him in the end. But we shouted ourselves horse and we didn't get the money but we had a great time, you know. <laughs> if Pivotal was your first group one, then what did it mean to win your first group one at home, Newmarket, in 1990? Our Brada, the second one I think was tremendous because she'd been very difficult to train um, the first year, the three-year-old year, when she won the Champion Stakes, everything went right and she was improving and improving and it was so easy, you know. The next year, everything went wrong. All those little things that make all us trainers nervous wrecks and uh, went wrong with her and we just could not get her right and at last she came, just late, late in the autumn. And I had a marvellous old 
horse you'd remember called Farmost, who won us 16 races and he used to be our lead horse for these really important gallops and he was very very reliable and better still he would lead the gallop and if the good horses came past him he would still keep on so he gave you an accurate measurement and I keep a, a detailed workbook and when she won her first champion stakes she uh, far most she gave him 36 pounds and beat him a length and exactly a year later just before the champion stakes when she he'd been com she'd been completely out of form she worked with him same weights exactly and beat him a length again so the two of them repeated their gallop exactly and Miss Rousing was, wasn't keen for her to run in the second champion stakes unless she'd run very well you know and uh, she said oh, well I don't really want to run her unless you think so I said well I don't know if she'll win the champion stakes Miss Rousing but Farmost said she, that she will and Farmost was right yeah. so it was uh, I think that second win because of all the trouble and the difficulty was it was a great day it was a great day and it was a it was an important day for George he'd had plenty of trouble at that time Alvarado lifts the champion stakes again Alvarado the winner she for his second finish one and two and so every credit conceivable to the connections of Alvarado a truly magnificent performance to win this race for the second time is no mean achievement with a horse with interrupted preparation that she's endured is just simply brilliant but Sir Mark Prescott took the race last year they've taken the game with a horse that's willing and good the likes of Alvarada, Pasternak, Pivotal and Spindrifter all appear on the Roll of Honour outside Heath House but which of those horses gave Sir Mark Prescott the most pleasure? I suppose Spindrifter winning what was then the record number of races in a year for a two-year-old I think that was probably the most exciting and because it was drawn out over such a long period would he break the record wouldn't he uh, will you run him in this condition race will you duck Peter Easterby's and, you know the tension went right the way on until he got beaten a short head on the penultimate day of the season to actually beat the record he, he equaled it so I think that was a prolonged excitement and um, I derived tremendous pleasure from the fact that he was only allotted seven stone 13 in the free handicap and yet by placing he'd, he'd won 16 races I think that was the measure of his achievement and to a degree one's own involvement was that he really wasn't all that good but you were able to utilize his toughness and his durability and the program book to get a tiny little place in history for him you know what matters most, having fun and, in, and enjoying the work and, and the sport or winning? I think, uh, I think uh, both are very important and probably you can't have one without the other. I, I don't think, you know, I always say every trainer is as healthy as his horses. If his horses are running well, then most trainers are fine, you know. And if your horses are sick and out of form, it, it's, it's for very hard and uh, or you've got horses that are no good you know there's plenty of good trainers out there make no mistake who no, never see the light of day because things go wrong Mr Amos is the um, very marvellous uh, jockey club estates manager for Newmarket and he was telling me the other day I think the figures are right that he's been here 12 years or 13 years and there were 66 trainers when he came and there are 66 trainers in Newmarket now how many of them that were training when he first came are training today? And the answer is 12. Only 12 of the 66. So the public think, of course, that the trainers stay the same because the, name, the names at the top remain the same. But through that very thin crust, every now and again a new one pops up, every now and again someone falls through. But underneath is a seething mass of people who are trying to, to make a go of it and are beaten by a combination of bad horses, bad payers, um, sick horses, you know. So I think all trainers really, you know, it, it, they're as healthy as their horses and if their horses are doing well, then they're in a relaxed enough frame of mind to have fun and enjoy, and enjoy when I say have fun, to get fun out of training the horses. But uh, I think I'm very lucky in that I've got lots of other interests 
and so I'm able when my horses are all coughing and splattering or whatever and I, I'm able to think to I enjoy the theatre, I enjoy the art galleries, I, I love the balls. Uh, uh, most of my friends are from other walks of life and they're not in the slightest bit interested how many times foreign affairs cough this morning. Do you see what I mean? So I'm able to lose myself in uh, whilst you're giving the horses a bit of time. Uh, not that you're not here and on the ball, of course you are, but I'm able to lose my mind into other things that, that uh, are able to, uh, to release the pressure a bit. And I think, you know, one of the sort of the why training is so unbelievably stressful is that A, most of it is beyond your control uh, and you're at the hands of fate, you know, your best horse strains a tendon, gets a knee chip or whatever it is, nothing you can do about it, you know. Uh, so if you haven't something else to interest you, it's very easy for this to rule your whole life and, and uh, ruin your life, you know. Your, your horses, people say that sometimes they've been trained for two seasons, so you summer and, and autumn, but they don't come right at the beginning of a year. Um, I don't know whether I'm right, but I've always thought that, or for some time I've thought that any horse can only do two-thirds of the season. So as long as he gets his two-thirds, it doesn't matter when. Um, and I don't think many horses come very early in the year. And I also think that the program book is very tight until about the middle of May. So I've never thought that there's any need to hurry them in the early part of the year, unless you've got a guinea's horse. Uh, and this year we had Humoresque, who knocked up a couple of listed races and a group three and all that early in the year because she was fit from the all weather, she was in good form, and she might as well keep going, you know. But I, I feel that there's much more of a program in the middle of the year. And so, as most horses don't come naturally in the spring, I've never believed in, in forcing them to do so. So I let the ones come that want to. I don't try not to run them, if that makes sense to you. I let the ones come that want to but I don't hurry at all the rest of them until I think they're all in really good form and all the respiratory disease which tends to hang around in the spring is, is well under control and then push on, you know. So it tends to be in the spring that uh, I get the best of the theatre or the best of the uh, art gallery or whatever it is, you know, and then once the beastly things are all in cracking form, I'm afraid that's the end of the culture until the end of the season, you know. Let's talk about the two jockeys, George and Seb. I mean, the two that you have yeah. stable jockeys. They're, they're very different, but I mean, they're, well, they're wonderful they're, characters. They, they might be different to the, to the outsider or the layman, but stable jockeys require very defined qualities. Uh, they've got to be loyal, reliable. The owners have got to like them. They've got to be able to look to the future. Uh, they've got to be consistent. They've got to realise that for the owner breeder, that maiden at Subal is, is every bit as important as the Derby to somebody else. So, and they've got to be people who you like working with. And in my case, they've got to be professional. And uh, George and Seb combine, both of them combine all those qualities. So uh, I think we're probably the only trainer now who who retains a jockey. I think all the other jockeys are retained by owners. But uh, I consider them worth their weight in gold, you know. I suppose Seb will have to kill George to get the first job, though. I don't, George seems to keep going all the time. I don't know what Seb's going to have to do to get rid of him. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't look further than either of them ever. Mm -hmm. Most marriages don't last as long as your relationship <laughs> with George. No, no. And uh, years ago I said I've never looked at another I might have looked at another woman, but I've never looked at another jockey. And uh, I mean, you know, he's been a marvellous, marvellous jockey, and he's extraordinarily riding just as well now as ever. I, the travelling gets him down now. You know, he, he hates driving to Lingfield and things like that. But um, you know, his his enthusiasm for the game remains, and he's still probably, if not the the second strongest finisher in the game. You know. Uh, he's a remarkable man. Well, it's true, my first marriage didn't last as long as I've been with Sir Mark. Uh, but I think it's, it's a great working relationship. 
it um, it always has been. It's never been buddy buddy. It's always been you know business, full stop. You know it's always been about the horses and about the yard and the owners, and that's the way it's always been. And that's it's been very successful. When you first came here, you, you write in your book about how you were all didn't really know who who he was. He was 20, 21, 22. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was there as an apprentice, so I've been here a hell of a long time. I came in in 1962 to, to this yard uh, before Sir Mark even appeared on the scene, and he came as an assistant just after I just after I started riding. I was just getting going as, a, as an apprentice, and uh, we didn't see it eye to eye, understandably, I suppose. You know, um, we were both of that that age. You know, I think it's probably more me than him, but neither got on very well. Yeah, but uh, it's funny how it all turned out. How good will Seb be? Every bit is good. Every bit is good. I think he's um, he's got every quality that's that's needed uh, to be a top top jockey. Um, whether he'd go on as long as the old boy, uh, I don't know. You know, George is famously wiry frame. You know, George always comes to the yard looking a picture of health, uh, rather healthier than Seb coming in first thing in the morning, but. Uh, you know, he's he's uh, he's a very good jockey. And Seb told me when he when he first rode for you, he got his instructions in a, in a letter. Yes, that's right. Yes, uh, any outside jockey gets their 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 orders written. I hate having outside jockeys. I hate them immediately. I mean, <laughs> so they always get uh, written orders. And I remember one fellow saying, I can't remember what he said, but he sort of half queried them, and I said. These they're not a green paper for discussion. These are orders, not a green paper for this, for discussion. But obviously, you know, they they know how I think very well. So, so, uh, and I the first ride Seb had for us was at Sandown, and uh, the horse was owned by the boys. Uh, sorry, at Salisbury, the horse was owned by the boys, and Newmarket races were on, and we were watching on SIS, and I gave them a copy of the letter that I so said, so, so we'll see if this fellow can ride. And we had the copy of the letter in front, and every stride of the race, every stride of the race, he was where we told him to be. And that is the definition of a good jockey, because it's very hard to carry out orders, because there's another 18 fellows in the race all trying to be where you are. And a jockey who can carry out orders uh, is a pearl beyond price. And whilst obviously I give them flexibility, basically I want them to do as I say, because if that doesn't work, well, we'll try something else. If they do what I don't say, well, I know that didn't work, that's why I didn't tell them to do it. So it's a wasted run. So I do like, if, if possible, uh, whilst they've got discretion if necessary, their uh, lives and their hands a bit if they use it. <laughs> do you think people eulogise too much about the, the Fallons and the, the Tories and maybe overlook the Duffields and some? You know, I don't think there's much between the very, the, the very, there's an awful lot between the good and the bad, as in every profession. But the higher up you get in the scale, there's less and less between them. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's no doubt that you get a fellow riding absolutely at the top of his form, you know. Um, and con the jockeys ride on confidence, I think. And the trainer's main thing is to try and give them confidence. Confidence in you. That if it goes wrong, well, there we are. They must have confidence in you. And uh, like all sportsmen, jockeys ride on confidence. And you, as the trainer, you've got to give them confidence. You know, and it, as soon as the trainer starts saying the owner didn't want you, he really wanted Fallon, but I stuck by you, and we've had a few quid on it today. Uh, if you want to get a perfectly good jockey to ride a bad race, that's the way to go about it. You know, you've got to give them confidence. planning a richer future? I'm here to ask the Dean family what they'd do with a valuable cash sum from saving with Bonus Cash Builder Plus. Hi Janet, what would you do? Well, I'd build a nest egg for the kids' future. Towards college probably, mm. or maybe a wedding. What would you do with the money then, Bob? I'd draw the new car. Anything in mind? Yeah, as a matter of fact. Here, 1.8. Air conditioning, leather seats. Jamie? I want to go to Florida. But the thing is, Carol, we can't afford to save very much. Well, with Bonus Cash Builder Plus, you can start saving from just £10 a month. And after 15 years, you'll receive a guaranteed cash sum. Great. And after just one year, you get half your money back. 
If you start saving now, you can receive this brand new Bush DVD player. Over 200,000 people are saving with Bonus Cash Builder Plus from Access Fund Life. Phone 0800 60 80 80 today for details. You could enjoy a richer future. So why not join them? Are you over 50? And do you have a pension you're not currently receiving? If the answer is yes and you need cash right now, then speak to Direct Pensions today. Because we could turn your pension policy into this. Just one call and you could receive a tax-free cash sum from your pension without worrying about repayments or interest rates. All you have to be is over 50 with a pension, like Mr. Stott. He's glad he called Direct Pensions. They helped release a significant amount from his pension when he really needed the money. Or Mrs. Percival, she called Direct Pensions and they made unlocking her pension both simple and straightforward. That's right, so don't wait. Call this number now or simply log on to our website and we'll help you understand what you've got tied up in your pension. Taking pension benefits early will reduce your income in retirement and unlocking pension benefits may not be suitable for everyone. Speak to Direct Pensions now on 0800 298 2058 and find out how you can unlock your pension. That number again, 0800 298 2058. Call now. So Mark is a trainer who never lacks confidence. But what does he think of the racing press? Well, I think racing's got a marvellous press. I genuinely do. Uh, I, I just think that it's a shame now that everything's so uh, uh, carefully analysed that all the information is available to everybody. <laughs> I much preferred it when everybody could watch each race once. And it was up to you. If you were good enough, you could see it. And if you weren't good enough, you couldn't. There's no um, yeah, now, you know, and I used to go racing. I don't go racing very much now because I can watch SIS in the old days or at the races now. And my time is much better employed being out third lot. And today we've got 18 two year olds to put through the stalls. I'm really much better off doing that than I am driving six hours in total for one and a half minutes to see a horse run. Uh, whereas in the old days, it was important to go it really mattered because you needed to see it and um, as any trainer will tell you if you don't see a race by the time the head lads rung you and told you what happened and then the jockeys rung you and told you what happened you're beginning to wonder if anyone was at the meeting at all and by the time the press have reported it you, you think it's a fictional meeting <laughs> so in the old days it was very important to go uh, whereas now uh, it's less important and of course the race is analysed sk skillfully and all your statistics are, are out all the time. In the old days you didn't have a winner for three months as long as you told nobody. Nobody knew. Now everybody knows that it's 68 days since you had a runner or what, whatever, you know. So I suppose the pressure is much more on us all to perform than it was in the old days, you know. If you said nothing nobody noticed. So does it help when we tell you that you haven't had a winner for a month or that, you know, you've had... You well, no, I, I don't find it very helpful. I always remember, I always remember one day having a terrible season and I, I turned up at July meeting, you know, having only had five winners, they're all coughing and they're only just coming right, you know. There's one of those awful race course bores came up to you, you know, and you're absolutely dreading seeing anybody, of course. And this poor fellow came up to me and he said, uh, oh, hello, he said, uh, you're having a quiet season. And I said, thank you so much for telling me. I'd have never f***ing well noticed if you hadn't told me. I mean, it's an unbelievable thing to say to someone, yeah. <laughs> but as trainers, probably only the theatre is more exposed to daily, to daily review, really. And, uh, and jockeys, of course, you know. So I think that's added to the pressure. Um, and um, I think I, I've not enjoyed all my pet little theories about you must make the running at Ripon and uh, jockeys get into more trouble coming behind at Ripon than anywhere else. I do hate it now when every expert on at the races is busy telling everyone what I've rather enjoyed, <laughs> what I've rather enjoyed using for, for a few years. So I've not enjoyed the, uh, the loss of any advantage I'm, I might have had, but I, I think that um, we've got a, a marvellous press and by and large a very understanding press. You've had some amazing assistant trainers. Yes, uh, I've had some very good ones. Um, William Haggis? William, 
um, trained Derby winner, uh, David Loader, uh, Christian Wall, uh, Dr. Scargill, uh, Ian Jury, trained best pal in the States, Francois Roa, doing terribly well in France, Pascal Barry. Um, I think I'm in danger, really, of doing what Frenchie Nicholson once said to me about Pat Eddery and Tony Murray, that his trouble was that he taught them all to ride better than he did. <laughs> and I think I'm teaching these boys to, to train better than I did, but they've, they've done very well and I gain great, great pleasure from their successes. And if I have to be beaten by anybody, which I, I don't like being beaten by anybody, but if I have to be beaten by anybody, I'd far rather be beaten by them than anybody else. And of course, they derive tremendous pleasure, of course, from beating me, yes. There's always that little smirk over the rail. <laughs> when I'm standing in the second enclosure. But there's never any question and repeating that famous line from Star Wars when, where he says, I was once the pupil but now I am the master. Never, never a chance of them saying that to you. Well, I don't know. They, I, I, think, uh, I think a few of them, maybe they let it pass through their mind, but I, uh, you, the film you obviously quote is Star Wars, but I would quote back at you The Hustler when uh, famously Edward G. Robinson on that last hand of cards, out plays Steve McQueen. And he says, you're good, kid. You're very good. But whilst I'm around, you'll always be second best. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's probably not true anymore, but I flatter myself with it might be. What did you uh, enjoy most about your two years with Sir Mark? <laughs> I'm not sure enjoy is the right word, Ian. I uh, think I went there in about 80, 1980. In those days, Smart wore a pair of thick rim spectacles. Never had a cigar out of his mouth. He used to be up at five o'clock in the morning mowing the lawn. Um, he was a very tough, nasty person to work for. Would you say that his bark is worse than his bite? Uh, wouldn't, I wouldn't know, really. I was, not, I was barked at a few times, but never bitten. But there were a few there that were bitten. I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. I turned up there as an innocent young boy and uh, naturally was completely in awe of Sir Mark, who, despite the fact that he's now about uh, 20 years older than he was when I went there, still looks exactly the same. And I think at the time we all thought he was about 60 going on 80. Um, and uh, he very kindly employed me for a year, and at the end of the year he said, I've had enough of you, it's time you went. <laughs> One of the reasons that I went there was because my father had a horse. I, can, I, I think it was uh, after, yeah, it was certainly before I went there. And my father's now in his 70s, but uh, before his 50th birthday party, Sir Mark ran his first horse for my father. Uh, uh, needless to say, it was at Hamilton, first time out, and it was su subject of good home reports. And my father, unfortunately, couldn't go because, he, as I say, he was celebrating his birthday the following day. So the horse ran at 7.05 on a Saturday night at Hamilton. And uh, I shouldn't really tell the story because he'd probably tell it much better than me. But uh, um, when the horse finished fifth of six, uh, a well-back favourite, father was rather dismayed. He'd listened to it on the blower in those days. There were no TV cameras, obviously. And... Um, he uh, got a phone call the next morning from Sir Mark at nine o'clock sharp, and he still rings him every Sunday at nine o'clock sharp. And um, the conversation went on for 40 minutes about every step this horse had trodden since it left Heath House in Newmarket to its arrival at Hamilton, from the saddling boxes, from the way it walked around the paddock, every step it took, and cantering down the start, and how it was sweating, and how the ground was this. And, yeah, he was a bit uh, funny in the stalls and eventually uh, the horse ran, fell out of the stalls, fell down the hill and then ran on steadily. Uh, how it could run on steadily and only beat one, I don't know, but didn't finish fifth. And my father, who was trying to act intelligently, said, uh, tell me, Mark, do you think he needs further as the race was over six firms? And he said, Christ, Brian, I can't send the thing any further than Hamilton. And <laughs> After that remark, my father's been endeared to him ever since, and quite rightly has huge enjoyment and much respect. I <coughs> have difficulty getting my father to send one to Yorkshire um, uh, to race, 
and uh, let alone Scotland. But if Sir Mark rang him up and said, I think I've found a race for your horse in Bangladesh, it would be gone in the morning. So fair play to him. When, certainly when I worked there, jeans were absolutely forbidden in the yard at any stage of the day. And um, it amuses me greatly now that the only pair of set of trousers he's got is jeans. <laughs> so uh, um, I remind him of that persistently. You feel I felt, I felt I've grown up a lot since I've come here, uh, you know, and that's probably down a lot to the way Sir Mark's teaching you all the time and just to behave yourself and, you know, always to, uh, you know, to just always mind what you're, what you're doing, really. Those who've ever met Sir Mark Prescott would be united in what the trainer hates most. The answer, a lack of punctuality. He hates people being late. You know, if he says eight o'clock, he means eight o'clock. It doesn't mean two minutes past eight or five minutes past eight. It's it's eight o'clock. You know, and I've, uh, but luckily for me, I've always been someone that's been able to get up in the morning and and get myself motivated and get myself there in in good time. You know, so it's, I've never had to cross swords with him over that over that situation. You know, I mean, there, there was an occasion when uh, the first year I was here, and uh, we had to be in for seven o'clock. I, I was waltzing in the yard with all the time in the world and he asked me what time I was meant to be here and I said seven o'clock. He said, well, by my watch is 30 seconds past. Get on your horse sort of thing and, uh, and I mean, that's all it that said, but uh, I sort of know my place. <laughs> on the third time I was late, he visited me. I shared a house with John Warren, the noted bloodstock agent and advisor. And he visited uh, the house trying to wake me up and he poured one of my saucepans full of water and went and nearly threw it and struck Warren over the head but Warren pointed to my bedroom unfortunately and he came in and whacked me over the head with a, a uh, threw the water over me and then whacked me with a pan and he wasn't doing it with a smile on his face either and the following morning I, I slept about one and a quarter hours and I was there before he'd even started his lawnmower I think my job after that was to, to muck out his chickens for a week. Uh, but I can assure you I wasn't late again, and I've been very rarely late since. That's some years ago. Timing everything to Sir Mark Prescott has indeed his loyalty. And the lad was was yanking this thing in the mouth, and he was pulling it around, and I, I just said, yeah. And it wasn't actually doing anything. If it was misbehaving, you could understand it, but it wasn't actually doing anything. And I just said, just leave it alone, and he turned around, and, you know. He told me to F off and, you know, and all that. And I went at him and I, riding out, didn't get him. I said, when, when we get in, boy, you're getting it, you know. And I just, I just when I got it, I just just punched him in the in the side room then. Knocked him flat on his backside. What is the mark there? Well, he'd, he'd, got a, he'd got a black eye and a busted nose and that, you know. And, and um, he didn't know at the time, and the, the landlady, who, lives across the road there where all the boys live. She reported it to Sabak that I hit the lad, you know, and of course he asked the lad, you know, what uh, why, why did uh, why did G Duffield punch in the nose and it's uh, and so <laughs> and he said he'd swore at me and all that because I told him to leave this horse alone and that so he he gave him another dig in the ribs. <laughs> but just misbehaving, you know, and speaking to the stable jockey like that and, 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 and abusing the horse. your conservatory there yeah. are pictures you've taken of, of, of the oh, bullfight yeah. tell us about Pamploma and your, your first visit <laughs> there and, and, and just well I love the bulls of course to the average Anglo-Saxon it's absolutely impossible to understand and I always say you know to people that the average Spaniard has as much chance of enjoying a day's cricket if he walks into Lord's cricket ground not knowing the rules as you have of enjoying a bullfight if you go to Barcelona so you know you've got to understand it before you can enjoy it and, and realize that it's it's not a sport it's an art it's reported on the culture page not the sports page it's not bull six matadors nil you know so it's really quite a complex thing but I, I started going when I was 15 because I'd uh, my girlfriend was 17 and two years older than me and uh, when the topic of where shall we go on holiday came up which in those days National Hunt Racing closed down for a month in the summer when the topic of the holiday came up, I had to select somewhere where I didn't have to drive because, of course, I was incapable of driving. And I just read The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, which is all about Pamplona and the 
the Fiesta there and the Ferry. And uh, I heard myself saying, you know how you lie at that age, oh, we'll go to Pamplona, you know, and I hadn't really a clue where Pamplona was, and it turned out to be two and a half days in a bus from Portsmouth to Paris, Paris to Marseille, Marseille over the Pyrenees. And we arrived, we were absolutely exhausted. And Mr. Hemingway hadn't pointed out to me that the population of Pamplona, I don't know, is about 20,000. And during Bull Week, there's a half a million on top. So we, we never found a, a bed or anything. And we wound up sleeping for two and a half days on the government, the steps of the government offices, which wasn't really conducive to the romance I'd planned. <laughs> but, but fortunately, the, the bulls fascinated me, you know, and of course the, the, the town with half a million drunks in it and six bulls hurtling down the street at seven o'clock in the morning and then the corridas in the afternoon is, and you're in love with your first girlfriend. It's a pretty sort of heady atmosphere. And uh, I, I really got very, very interested. And um, after a couple of years, I didn't go back to Pamplona because the crowd is less focused on the bulls. There's more drinking and eating than... And I started to go to the more serious ferries. And then when I started training, of course, I, I couldn't afford to go when I was paying for all of this. I didn't go for about 10 years, but I, I kept taking the magazines and I kept up to date with it. And then when uh, I was better placed and, and I started to go again, and now I go four weekends a year if I can, if not five. And they are in my diary and I go, you know. I always say hasten to add was trained from the bull ring at Bézier because the, the Bézier Ferrier is the weekend before, uh, before York, you know. And have you actually done the run through? Oh yes, the first three or four years I did, yes. yes. There's a, upstairs there's a very well-known painting of, um, uh, but we're a very well-known photograph, which was on Time Life magazine, which shows a 16-year-old Prescott with a luxuriant crop of hair, which is long gone, uh, getting flattened by one of these bulls as it comes into the ring at... Uh, uh, at Pamplona, but uh, it's a, it, it's a marvellous occasion. You obviously love bullfighting, but until recently, football and Manchester United and <laughs> Sir Alex Ferguson meant little to you. I well, understand. yes, famously, Mr. Ferguson rang, and uh, or I think his age, somebody rang anyway, and said, "Would I have a horse for for him?" And he he was Mr. Ferguson then, and I think I would have heard of him now, you know. And I said, no, I'm very sorry, we're, we're full. And they said, well, you, you've heard of Manchester, Manchester, haven't you? So I said, no, not really. So he said, Manchester United, so, so a football team. I said, I'm very sorry, I've got no... And Paul Colin Nutter, my marvellous head lad who you met today, I don't think he's ever forgiven me, really, that I, that I didn't know who Mr. Ferguson or Sir Alec Ferguson was. But I've met him since with Ed Dunlop. Yeah. <laughs> and you smoothed it over then? Uh, well, I, I think we sort of glossed over it, yeah. <laughs> Heath House combines the best of the past with the most modern training establishments. So Mark Prescott wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I'm very lucky because I always say you're just a tenant here, you know, because uh, I own it, but I'm a tenant really of a marvellous, marvellous training yard and following on some wonderful trainers. And hopefully you've tried to improve the facilities to make it what I think is probably the most modern yard in Newmarket. But all the modern things, the pool and the walkers, are hidden away so that if Matt Dawson and uh, Fred Archer ever walk back in the yard, hopefully it looks exactly the same. But it's, but it's all been updated. And um, uh, Matt Dawson still, I think I'm right in saying, has trained more classic winners than any trainer in, in history. And he famously said, when he was an old man, and they said to him, what was the best horse you ever trained? And he said, I only trained one good horse in my life, and that was St. Simon. <laughs> trained more good horses than anybody else. But St. Simon, his, um, his skeleton you can see in the Natural History Museum. And his skin is preserved here in the, as we go into the ride. And the Duke of Portland, who owned him, was at great pains to uh, retain as much of the horse as you could in those days, so that if one day it was interest to someone, it was there. And most interestingly, three years ago, my, uh, Massachusetts University came along to cut a bit off his skin, off his pelt, uh, for DNA. So the Duke of Portland, a hundred years before anyone had thought of DNA, uh, he was saving enough so that that could be done. So he must have been a very far-sighted man. And of course, if you read the Newmarket tourist books, um, Matt Dawson and Fred Archer are supposed to haunt the Moulton Road and this yard. 
and uh, maybe they do, but I've looked round here every night of my life at half past ten in the evening, and I'm dying to meet them. <laughs> but they've never said a word to me yet. You but your bedroom might be haunted. Well, yes, well, poor old Harry Sadler died in it. Yeah. <laughs> I think of him every July the 14th. So Mark Prescott has been training at Heath House for more than 30 years, and talking to him, you really appreciate his love for the headquarters of British flat racing. How do you think history will remember you? Well, I doubt very much if you'll be remembered in history. Um, it was very interesting when they had those hundred, what was it, the racing post. You know, it's just very, very modern people, you know, uh, basically remembered. But I suppose if I'm remembered in history at all, uh, I would like to be remembered for um, having been part of a very vigorous committee that uh, resuscitated the Waterloo Cup, which I think is still one of the great sporting prizes. Uh, I'd like to feel that I'd done something as chairman of the Heath Committee to preserve Newmarket because the gallops here are the most important thing about the Newmarket. The race course is important, but there's 59 other towns with a race course. The reason 2,000 horses are here, the reason 5,000 horses are at the studs around, the reason Tatsels are here, the insurance companies are here, RTS are here, is because of the Heath. And the Heath is the single most important thing about Newmarket. Because of the Heath, the railway in 1836 went under it. During the war, not an acre was ploughed for carrots. When the motorway came, it went four and a half miles round it. We didn't get overspill. So Newmarket is the Heath. And uh, I have worked hard and enjoyed being chairman of the Heath Committee to try and ensure that it's here for hopefully the next 300 years. And when we walked up Warren Hill today, I said to you, you know, this was last ploughed in 1666. You went to school after me, but I think that's the great fire. And, um, you know, we're walking on the same grass. It's never been sown. It's never been fertilized. It's never been watered. We're walking on the same grass that King Charles went on. And if we look after it properly, and the uh, political supremos don't run the game out of business. Uh, hopefully there'll be horses trained here in two or three hundred years afterwards. I think it'll remember some art for all these big coups and all these big handicaps, you know, and, and a man that's, that terrifies the bookmakers when he's got one in a big handicap, and, and he'll lay a horse out, you know, without, without cheating, you know, without stopping it and things like that. He'll lay a horse out for a big handicap a year in advance. You know, and, and try to get it to, to that race with the right weight, a weight that he thinks it's capable of carrying and winning with. And uh, I think that's where we'll be famous for all these, all these big coups with the Cambridgeshire and, and, and the John Smiths and, and, you know, and the Ebers and various things, yeah. He reads the race very well. Um, you know, I mean, some days I, I, I get off horse and I think I'll give it a, a dreadful ride. And, you know, he's read the race so well that, you know, you, you put the phone down thinking you, you haven't done too bad a job after all, but um, I think I think it's one of the a great assets is, is he reads the race so well. And, um, you know, he, he, he understands what the, you're thinking at the time, so you, you go out there riding with plenty of confidence. How difficult will it be for the next trainer at Heath House after St Mark, whenever that may be, it may be 20, 30 years down the line, but how difficult will it be to follow in his footsteps? Uh, I would think it would be very difficult because the, the whole thing about heat, heat House really is consistency and attention to detail. Every year for I don't know how long, we've passed the 50 winners, winners mark. I've been here for four and we've done it and we've, just, we've done it already this year. Is there anywhere in Newmarket that's quite like Heath House and any trainer in Newmarket quite like Sir Mark Prescott? No, not now. <laughs> I think he's uh, very much one of a kind. Um, he's very much of the, uh, the, the type of trainer that probably was quite prevalent here. Uh, 40, 50 years ago when and Sir Mark learned his trade with Jack War uh, in the 1960s, which was another a, a very much a regimented yard. But I wouldn't say that was peculiar to Newmarket. I think a lot of yards throughout the country were run in those sort of quite strict, almost military fashion. The thing about Sir Mark is I believe he knows from beginning of the season, before Doncaster starts in March, where every one of his horses is going to end up, which races he wants to run them in, and he decides, and, and unless, as long as the horse is alive on that day, it runs in the race. I know before we had 
uh, the five day declaration. I would often get a phone call, we used to have the calendar then, which came out three weeks before uh, a certain race. And when he was doing his entries, I'd often get a phone call at home about 9.30, 10 o'clock. Uh, Low Prescott here, uh, Musselburgh, July the 12th, and we, you know, we're still about the 23rd of June. Um, claimer, I'm entering a horse, it's got your weight, can you ride? Now you have to say yes or no then, you know. It was no, I'll let you know, that was nothing to do with that. And you think so, well, you know, he's putting it in it my way. He either fancies it or he thinks, well, I want to make certain I've got somebody to ride it on the day at that weight because not many people could do 7778. But uh, most of the time, uh, they did go in. And I think he still does that now. He knows from day one, he evaluates his horse, he looks at them, he has a plan for every one of them. And I would think, unless something goes wrong with the horse, he sticks to it. Whereas most of the trainers now with this five-day entry system, you know, they, they enter horses willy-nilly. If it happens to work well, they'll shove it in a race. I don't think you ever see Sir Mark doing that. I think that's the difference with him and a lot of other trainers. Everything Sir Mark Prescott says and does has been thought through and planned. It's the Heath House way. Luck, though, did play its part in setting Newmarket's most eligible bachelor on his way to a training career, which has been pursued with gusto, but which the man himself admits has to be put into perspective. My father always said the greatest gift is knowledge and if you can pass on whatever little bits of knowledge you've gained onto another generation then that'll do. So if we can keep the assistant trainers going, the Heath going and the Waterloo, I, I think I'd settle for that really.